So when the Lord gets ready, you got to move. And the Lord, of course, metaphysically means the law. And the law is how the power in the present moves through each and every one of us. So there is that something, I like to call it the great spirit, that lives and moves and expresses through each of us. It is a higher power that guides us, guards us, protects us, and directs us. And when I stand in the power of that presence, spirit is expressed through me as joy, which is the title of my talk this morning. So this movement of spiritual energy is common within all of life. It is actually an integral part of our collective unconscious. And the appeal of this life force or the divine spark within us is its ability to manifest through us our dreams and our desires. The fact that we can recognize the difference between the plants, the animals, the minerals, and the humans whenever we encounter them means that this movement of energy must come about through a common field or what we call in this movement the subjective mind. And our collective racial or common dreams match. This is how the 144,000 souls who hold this reality do the work that they do. Our individual dreams, on the other hand, are not alike because this is the personalized use we make of that one power or what is more commonly known as our personality. So the great spirit wants to express through us. And because we are one with the one, the ideas that we hold in our minds are equal in power to the ideas of that spiritual energy. And this is what they mean in scripture when they say, before they call, will I answer? So before our prayer is formed into words, it is already being acted upon by this higher power, by this spiritual energy. And Dr. Ernest Holmes, who is the founder of the Science of Mind teaching, tells us that it is the coming forth of spirit into expression, the loosing of energy into action that is apparent in all of creation. And you hear us on Sundays talk about the fact that we explore the marriage of science, religion, spirituality, using the principles of science of mind to grow our conscious awareness of our oneness. And what a beautiful thing this is, that we can love and support our brothers and sisters, regardless of their socioeconomic background welcoming everyone, regardless of color, creed, size, or shape. Helping each other to expand our idea of who we are as spiritual beings having a human experience. So this is about the idea of a spiritual marriage, one that's open to the adventure of love rather than the traditional cookie cutter mold of the past, till death do we part. Which reminds me about the story about the priest, the minister, the rabbi, who are asked to answer the question, when does life begin? Well, the conservative priest answered, at conception. The liberal minister said, after 20 days or something like that. The rabbi answered, when the, question, when the children have graduated and the dog has died. <laughs> so we're talking about a different kind of spiritual relationship 
a different kind of marriage in my uh, second experience of that, my vows actually said, till love do we part. And he's now in Texas. <laughs> so Buddha, Allah, Jesus of Nazareth, and the many of our great teachers have dedicated their lives to fulfilling this spiritual dynamic. Buddha actually defined Christ as a bodhisattva. And a bodhisattva is simply one who comes with love to participate in the sorrows of the world. Saint Augustine is quoted as saying that when he went to the cross, he went as a bridegroom to his bride. So when life seems most challenging, it is an, always an invitation to find deeper meaning within our own experience. And whenever and wherever that happens and the inner power is activated, there is a new consciousness that unfolds from within each of us, and that is called the spiritual adventure. And I'm not sure who this quote comes from, but it's absolutely one of my favorites. Life should not be a journey to the grave with the attention of arriving safely in an attractive and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in sideways Chardonnay in one hand, chocolate in the other, body thoroughly used up and totally worn out, screaming, Woohoo! What a ride! <laughs> so, the science of mind teaching is not a rose tinted spectacle teaching. We do not make believe that everything is okay. There is a science in the science of mind. Go figure. And that is what I continue to rise in love with this teaching, because it is scientifically provable. And if you don't believe me, just look up Phineas Parkhurst Quimby. There are 5,000 documented healings as a result of this teaching. So seeing the reality, recognizing it for what it is, experiencing the grief, the sadness, the limitation, but it's also about finding the joy within the sorrow. We are, after all, spiritual beings having a human experience. And it's important for us to really engage in that experience. Our first visions of that date back to the shamanic caves, when hands-on experience led to inquisitive illumination. In the ninth millennium BC, those shamans developed into priests. And the priests became the deities to the larger group and formed something what we're all familiar with called religion. Now our deities seem to be dominated by our institutions. Government, newspaper, television, and yes, even social media. It doesn't really matter what they say or how they say it, as long as we listen from our own spiritual perspective. Feel the sounds, feel the vibrations from a place of heartfelt peace. I'm here for the same reason that you are, to grow my greater conscious awareness of our oneness. Moving past our individual as well as our collective limitations is about finding the authenticity in our lives. Exploring the ideas of what we've been taught and evolving a unique new path towards the evolution of our soul. If someone or something is pushing your buttons, ask why. Even though it appears to be outside of you, inevitably there is something within you, an energy that you are repressing. And you might have to get down and dirty to release it. Ooh, some power in that. <laughs> and in the open life uh, interviews with Tom, um, Michael Toms, Joseph Campbell says, to reactivate our world to a vision quest, one has to deal with our world. So the slightest shadow of our most subtle concepts 
move through that universal subjective mind, and they become the experience that we embody. If our vision of a new Earth is only backed by a partial belief, what do you think is going to happen? There's only going to be a tendency towards that evolution. So the divine spark within us uses our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, and even our physical body to gather energy for its creative purposes. We are dealing with a force that we cannot fool. And so I just refer back to the story of Prince Five Weapons. He used everything he had. But the moral of the story is that the only weapon you really need is within you. Back of everything in the manifest world, there is a belief that supported its creation. And many of us look to our myths and fairy tales for imagination and inspiration. But if we are to create a new earth, we have to be in the action of the change we wish to see. So make sure you're holding on to those blankets and filling them with love. Joseph Campbell says, we must be willing to give up the life we planned so that we can live the life that's waiting for us. It is only through our hands-on experiences which, of course, we always attract for our own spiritual growth, that we can begin to recognize and integrate into our own inner truth what we've learned in real life. So use every weapon you have, especially the power of your mind. Joseph Campbell also says that the greatest realization of mythology is the eminence of the divine here and now. You don't have to go anywhere else for it. When our thoughts fall into that universal unconscious, the bodhisattva or the Christ light that is within us is born again. And when that happens, spirit can be expressed through us as joy. Thank you and namaste.